Welcome to Cimarron Valley Church. Today's message is titled, Fake News. It covers Isaiah 31, 1 through 3. Here's Pastor Paul with the message. My text this morning is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 31. Now, I know there are preachers that say we shouldn't be speaking from the Old Testament, but I still consider it Scripture. I believe the Bible. I believe all that's in the Bible, from Genesis through to Revelation. There are 66 books in the Bible, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. And I believe that every word in them is inspired of God. I truly believe that with all of my heart. And I believe that once we know the, the textual setting of a Scripture, it's much easier for us to understand it and to comprehend what the Lord was speaking. And that the Scripture is so much alive that it not only spoke in the day that it was written, but it continues to speak right here on November the 1st, 2020. We still can hear from, wor- from God's Word. Now, we have a special event that's taking place this week in our country. We call it our election, our uh, U.S. presidential election. It's a very, very special time in our land. This year, it seems that we've heard more about this election than in any other election that's ever been heard. We hear it every morning when we turn on our morning news and throughout the day. Uh, you, you, you can hear from different uh, news uh, stations and uh, different, uh, different ones who give news, and you'll hear different news, in fact. It seems as if none of the news media are on track with one another, but they actually fight among themselves, and we're caught in the middle of it all. Um, on who to believe and who not to believe, on who to trust and who not to trust, on what actually happened and what didn't happen. It seems that we are torn. We're the people that's in the middle of it all, and we're torn with all the things that we hear. But this one thing I know for certain that I share with you today, and that is that God's Word never changes, but that His Word is forever settled, and that you can put your total trust and faith in what God says to us in His Word. So, Isaiah chapter 31 is where I want to bring your attention this morning. However, this particular passage that I'm about to read to you is actually a prophecy that the scribe wrote, Isaiah's scribe wrote. It was a prophecy that was given at another time. It's very difficult to read the book of Isaiah in a chronological order because what you have in the book of Isaiah are the different prophecies that Isaiah uttered during his life and ministry on the earth. And a scribe would usually write down the words of the prophecy, much like you and I in our time, we, we can, what we call, and, and even our young people call this now, they say this is ancient when we use the word tape. We tape something or we record something. How many of you remember taping? We used to tape things. Now we record things. Now we have all kinds of other gadgets and, and, uh, items that, but they do the same. And that was the, uh, that was the office of the scribe. The scribe would write the words down so that they would forever be with mankind. And that's the words that I want to read to you this morning. And it was about a particular event that happened in the land of Judah. So if you'd stand with me this morning, I'll be reading Isaiah chapter 31, verses 1 through 3. Isaiah gave this prophecy, his scribe wrote it, and these are the words. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses and who trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong but who do not look to the Holy One of Israel, nor seek the Lord. Yet he also is wise and will bring disaster and will not call back his words, but will arise against the house of evildoers and against the help of those who work 
iniquity. Now the Egyptians are men, not God, and their horses are flesh and not spirit. When the Lord stretches out his hand, both he who helps will fall and he who is helped will fall down. They all will perish together. I've entitled this message this morning, Fake News. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you today for the word of the Lord, for we know that it is the strength that we need. It is the correction that we need. It is the instruction that we need in the time that we live. Though this book, this book and these words be ancient, they still hold true and hold life for us this day. I pray that you will give us a spiritual ear to hear your truth today. I pray that you will give us an open heart to receive the truth of God. I pray that you will give us a mind that can comprehend your word this day. I pray for this preacher today that clarity of thought and speech would come, that the words of the mouth and the meditation of the heart would be acceptable in your sight. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And you can be seated. <clears throat> now, we've heard this term, fake news. We've heard that a lot, haven't we? And we've heard it from all sides. I know that there's one character that probably says it more than, than others. But the truth of it is, <clears throat> when you listen to it all, and you take it all into perspective, you realize that in many cases, you are not hearing the entire truth. As I looked through the pages of the word of the Lord, I realized that this was also happening in times of and days of when Judah was strong and a nation. And especially under the leadership of a great man of God by the name of Hezekiah. Now you'll find Hezekiah's uh, story in Second Kings, also in Second Chronicles, but in Second Kings, I want to draw your attention there. And if you have, if you want to, you can turn there. I'll be in Second Kings chapters eighteen and nineteen. And by no means do I have the time to preach an entire message out of two chapters of the Bible today. But I'll be referring to some of the scripture that is in those two chapters because it tells the story of Hezekiah, this righteous king that was appointed of God, an ancestor of David, who was the 13th king of the land of Judah after David. Hezekiah was a man who did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. But he didn't just do that which was right. He wasn't a man of just mere words, but he was also a man of action. And when he took over as king, now the first nine years that he was a king, his father Ahaz, who was an evil king, who had set up pagan worship in the land of Judah. He had set up shrines. He had made alliances. He was paying tribute and tariffs to other nations of the world, especially the nation of Assyria at the time under King Sennacherib. This was the history of where Isaiah was when he gave these words of prophecy of those three verses, or in fact the entire uh, book, but in that chapter of 31, he was, he was relating to the time of Second Kings chapters 18 and 19 and the rulership of Hezekiah and what was going on. For nine years, Hezekiah ruled with his evil father, Ahaz. Ahaz died. And when Ahaz died, then Hezekiah became the supreme king. He became the ruler. He was 25 years old when he began to reign in Judah. Now, Judah, we know, is the southern kingdom, the kingdom that had not been taken over by the Assyrians. The northern kingdom, the ten tribes, were already in captivity to the Assyrians. The Assyrians at that time ruled the world. They were the power of the world. And when they swooped down 
and began to overtake feeble nations and weaker nations, they became even more powerful. And they would actually transport the young people from the nations that they subdued back into their motherland and have them to settle in new towns and new villages, this sort of thing, and cause them to leave the religion of their fathers, and especially the Israelite, the ten tribes, cause them to leave the commandments and the statutes and the ordinances and the word of the one and true living God. Hezekiah, when he came to rulership, refused to give in. Though his land, his nation still paid tariffs and tribute to the Assyrians to keep them at bay, he went throughout the land of Judah and tore down all the pagan altars, all the pagan shrines, and get this, you'll read this in the 18th chapter of 2 Kings. He even found out that people were worshiping the brass serpent that Moses held up in the wilderness. And he crushed it because he realized that was just a symbol. That is not God. And so he even crushed that and caused the people to worship the one true living God. That was his desire, that men followed God. He continued to pay the tribute that his father played, paid off to Assyria. But now he was growing weary and tired of paying this tariff and this taxation without representation. He was tired of giving in to the Assyrians, so he chose not to pay it any longer. And it wasn't long before the debt was called by the Assyrian king by the name of Sennacherib. And he wanted these, these people of Judah, the nation of Judah, and this new king to pay in full. He waited for several years. About 14, we, we learn from that scripture. About 14 years he waited. But the tribute wasn't paid, and now he was calling in the debt. And he wanted this debt to be paid or else he was coming down to, to take up this debt for himself and get the money for himself. So Hezekiah broke from his prior statement. And the Bible tells us in the 18th chapter of 2 Kings that he even melted the gold off the doors of the temple in order to have enough money, that he took all the silver in the cities of Judah and all the silver in the temple so that he would have enough money to pay off the king of Assyria so that they could be left alone. And then we see him leaning on the arm of flesh. And this is where the prophecy that I read to you from Isaiah comes in. Because the king of Egypt was still free. The Assyrians had not yet taken over the land of Egypt. So Hezekiah, this righteous leader of the land of Judah, the southern kingdom, thought it wise to take up an alliance with the nation of Egypt, and if they could get together in some sort of an alliance, they may be able to keep the Assyrians at bay. But the Egyptians were not a righteous people, and the Egyptians were not a people that followed God. They followed after the pagan gods of the world. And so Isaiah came forth with his prophecy to Hezekiah, and he said, Look here, don't go down to Egypt for help. They may have fast horses, and they may have many chariots, and if you look at the topography of the land of Egypt, you'll find that it was a plains type of land, flat. And so the Egyptians were known for their fast horses and their fast and swift chariots and for their many horsemen, men who were trained in battle to control horses and chariots. And so they were a feared land. They were, it and Judah were the last ones to be subdued by the Assyrians. 
So Hezekiah thought that it would be wise to lean on the arm of flesh. But Isaiah says, no. They may have fast horses. They may have swift chariots. They may have horsemen that are mighty, valiant soldiers. But they have forgotten who God is. So do not lean on the arm of flesh. Do not lean on man's understanding. Rather, find your help from the Lord. When the Assyrians got the news back that Hezekiah was no longer going to pay tribute, no longer going to pay the tariff, he was going to declare himself an independent nation, a nation that was not going to be subdued by another nation, but that his nation served the one true living God. And because of that, he refused to come under the auspices of another government. He sent news to the, all those that would hear that this was where Judah stood. Now you'd think that would be the end of it. I mean, God is God, right? And God is more powerful. You and I know that. Isaiah had prophesied it, that those who help that guy, those who stand with him, they'll all fall. That was the prophecy, right? We read it in verse 3 of chapter 31 of Isaiah. Everyone that stands with Sennacherib and the Assyrians will fall. All those who help him will fall. All those who pay tax and tariffs will fall. Because God is greater. But that wasn't the end of it. When Hezekiah stopped trusting in the arm of flesh and refused to go down to Egypt for the help that he needed, there came the assault of fear. Sennacherib, the king of the Assyrians, sent down three of his major generals, and they stood outside the gates of Jerusalem. And they beckoned to Hezekiah to come and to talk with them. It was a summit meeting, if you will. Come and talk to us. We have news from King Sennacherib for you. And Hezekiah sent out three of his men, three leaders in his country. They went out to speak with these three generals from the Assyrians. The Assyrian generals began to speak in the Hebrew tongue and not the Aramaic tongue that they were accustomed to. For on the walls of the fortified city of Jerusalem stood the guards and centurion soldiers, the soldiers of the Israelite military, standing guard on the gates and on the walls of the city of Jerusalem. And within their hearing, they could hear the three generals from the land of Assyria speaking in their Hebrew tongue and saying to them th things like that this day, I read it in 26, verse 26 of chapter 18, then Eliakim, the son of Hilkai, Shebna and Joah said to Rabashek, and that was one of the generals of Assyria, please speak to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it. In other words, we understand your language. Do not speak to us in Hebrew in the hearing of the people who are on the wall. What was he saying? You are, you are bringing fear to our military. You are bringing fear to our people as you speak these horrible things about what you're going to do. It was an assault of fear. Many times when you and I are in our dark moments, in our dark times, fear comes upon us because the enemy of our soul wants us to fear that our God is not able, that our God is not big enough, that our God cannot sustain us in our hour of trial. His voice needs to be quieted. And that's what the three leaders from Judah were saying to these men. But notice in the next verse it says that he spoke even louder. And this is what he says. But Rabshakeh said to them, Has my master sent 
to your master and to you to speak these words and not to the men who sit on the wall who will eat and drink their own waste with you. In other words, starvation, famine is coming to the city of Jerusalem. So he began to speak in words of assault and try to bring fear to the hearts of the people. And it's a rather lengthy, but I want to read to you what he said to them. So then he called out with a loud voice in Hebrew so that they would understand. And this is what he said. Hear the word of the great king, Sennacherib, the Assyrian king. Thus says the king, do not let Hezekiah deceive you. Hezekiah was telling them, let's follow God. Let's do what God wants us to do. What Isaiah the prophet has told us to do. For he shall not be able to deliver you from the hand of King Sennacherib, the Assyrian king. Let Nor let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah. For thus says the Lord, says the king of Assyria, make peace with me by a present and come out to me. In other words, come and bring your gifts, your homage, pay it to the king of Assyria. Make peace with me by a present and come out to me and every one of you eat from his own vine and every one from his own fig tree, and every one of you drink the waters of his own cistern. That sounds okay, doesn't it? Now you ready? Let me show you what socialism will do. You didn't know the preacher was headed there this morning, did you? This is what it says, until I come and take away Take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive groves and honey, that you may live and not die. But do not listen to Hezekiah, lest he persuade you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nations at all delivered its land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Have any of the other gods been able to keep the Assyrians from subduing the nations? Why, no God has been able to do this. What makes you think your God is greater? Where are the gods of all the other lands, of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sephraphim and Hena and Iva? Indeed, they have delivered Samaria from my hand, who among all the gods of the lands have delivered their countries from my hands, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem from my hand. In other words, for those of you standing on the wall that are listening to these three that, that Hezekiah has sent out here, let me tell you something. We're coming, and we're going to take over, and we're going to rule your land. And we're going to take your land. We're going to take your water. We're going to take your vineyards. We're going to take your gardens. We're going to take your dwelling places. We're going to take your families. We're going to take your educational system. We're going to take all these things and we're going to move you into our land. And you're going to live under our rules and do as we say. So you need to stop following this righteous leader, Hezekiah. And you need to come on over to Sennacherib, the king of the world. The Bible tells us that once this fear was set into the people, that the three rulers that, that Hezekiah had sent out, you'll read it at the end of chapter 18, they ran back into the palace. They ripped and tore their clothes. They put sackcloth and ashes upon themselves, and they said, King, it's doomsday. This is going to happen, and there's nothing that's going to stop it. Nothing has been able to stop the surge of the Assyrians. They are ruling the world. Now, you would think that that would shake a leader like Hezekiah to his very knees. Well, actually, it did. He ran into the temple of God, and he fell down before the Lord. And when he fell down before the Lord, he cried out to God. 
And when he cried out to God, God spoke to his heart and said, bring Isaiah down here. And he got Isaiah in there. And that 31st chapter of Isaiah that I just read, those three verses to you. If you get home, read the entire chapter, that entire prophecy. Isaiah told him this is not going to happen, that God is greater than all this. There was an answer to his faith. Hezekiah stood alone. His leaders did not stand with him. But Isaiah the prophet stood with him and told Hezekiah, don't get help from Egypt. Trust in your God. We are going to show the world that God is God. And if ever our world needed to know that there is a God in heaven, it is the moment that you and I live in. Now, who's going to tell the world that there is a God in heaven? It's no one but you and me. We are the prophet Isaiah. We are standing in the gap. We need to let the world know that Jesus is alive, that Jesus re is real, that Jesus is the only one that can save, that he's the only one that can heal our land. He's the only one that can forgive us of our sins. He's the only one that can help us in our time of need. We are coming to that place in our own nation where we're hearing the assault of fear and men are leaning on the arm of flesh. But the answer to it all is our faith in God. As time went on, and I close with this, as time went on, when Hezekiah got the word from Isaiah that God was going to see him through. The Assyrians gave one last assault. They sent a letter throughout all the region of the world at that time. And the letter said that Sennacherib was Lord of the earth, the most powerful king on the earth, that his armies were devastating armies by this time, even Lachish and Lichna and even Egypt had been overtaken. They were ruined. They were brought to nothing. The only thing that survived the onslaught of Sennacherib and the Assyrians was the land of Judah. And they had it totally encircled. They had it all within, within sight. All circled around it was the armies of Sennacherib. And Hezekiah took the letter. You read it in the 19th chapter of 2 Kings. And he went into the temple of God. And this is what he did. He laid the letter down in front of God. And he said, God, you can read just like I can. And this is what this man says. It's in the 14th verse of chapter 19. He received the letter from the hand of the messengers. He read it. He went up to the house of the Lord. He spread it before the Lord. Then he prayed before the Lord. And he said, Lord, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God. You alone you, of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to reproach the living God. Truly, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations and their lands. They have cast their gods into the fire, for they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they destroyed them. Now therefore, O Lord, O God, I pray, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord God, you alone. And Isaiah prophesied, the entire chapter of 31, chapter 31 of Isaiah, and he said, Sennacherib will come to nothing. And i got to read it for you. It's the end of chapter 19, verse 35. And it came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord, did you hear that? Wasn't an army, wasn't a military might. The angel of the Lord, this is in your Bible. The angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000 soldiers. The angel of the Lord. When Jesus was in the garden and Peter pulled out his sword 
and cut off Malchus the servant's ear, Jesus told him to do what? Put up your sword. If I wanted to, I could call 10,000 legions of angels. But I really only need one. 185,000 fighting men were destroyed by one angel of the Assyrian army in one night. What happened to Sennacherib? And when the people arose early in the morning, there were corpse, all dead. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, he departed and went away. He returned home. He remained at Nineveh, capital of Assyria. It came to pass as he was worshiping in the temple of Nishrach, his god, that his sons, Adramelech and Sherezer, struck him with the sword. And they escaped into the land of Ariot. The Eshurod, his son, reigned in his place. God is bigger than the problems that we have. We don't need the help of horses and chariots. We need to be counseling with one another and encouraging one another. But do not let the assault of fear Destroy your faith in a God who is bigger. Come Tuesday, our nation will elect a leader. We set in anticipation, maybe even some anxiety. We don't know who that might be. We probably have an idea in our heart or our mind at this point in time of who we would like it to be. But what if it's not the person we would like it to be? What if it's exactly the opposite? That that, does that mean that come Wednesday morning when I arise and find out who my president is, that that will destroy my faith in a living God? When I realize that the God I serve is not just the leader of a nation, but the earth is his literal footstool, that he is in charge. See, it's been fake news that's been coming at us, telling us who's in charge. Hezekiah knew who was in charge. Isaiah affirmed it to him that God was in charge and said, all this news that you've been hearing, you remember the letter you spread out in the temple and said, God, read this? That was all fake news because Sennacherib was not the final ruler. He was not the final God. There is a true and a living God, my friend. And come what may in our lives, we must never lose touch with who God is. Our faith and our trust must be totally in Him. Because I promise you this, He doesn't give fake news. His news is solid and true and righteous. And I'm telling you that he is coming again because he said he was. And that's not fake. I'm telling you that he said there is a place called heaven for his children. And that's truth. That's not fake news. He put it in here. It's written. And God will never go back on his word. He said that in Isaiah's prophecy in chapter 31. Whatever God said, that's what God will do. You can, you can take it to the bank. God will do what God said he will do. So if I leave this life, God is still in control of me. He still has me in the hollow of his hand. I'm asking you this morning, are you believing the fake news? Is all your life just right here? All the possessions that you have is just right here? You can't take a one with you no matter where you go. It'll all be left behind. That's fake news. Accumulate all you want. That's wonderful. That's fine. That's a blessing of God. I appreciate what God has given me. I thank God every day for what God has given me. I don't recall an evening that I don't sit in my easy chair and lean back and think, thank you, God, for the comfort you give me, because I know there are people without. He has blessed my life. He has blessed your life. I must serve him. The fake news is just that, fake news. I'm telling you, like Daniel of old, there is a God in heaven. And that's not fake.
news. I thank you today for truth again. What's about to happen in our land, O oh Lord? I pray that you will guide, and I pray that your will will be done. And I pray that as the people of God, we'll accept your will, your plan, your purpose, that we serve a true and a living God who sees all that happens and transpires in our world, who knows all the secrets and conspiracies of men. And when it comes to his purpose and his plan and his will, they are all subdued because he is God. Like Sennacherib of old, you know how to take care of your people. Like the angel that moved and 185,000 military men, strongest military might of the world at that time, were brought to their knees and their leader had to run back home. You are able. I thank you for the freedom we have in Christ this day. Now bless us today, guide us today, and guide our hearts this day, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Father, you see us right where we are today, right here in this place of prayer, the house of worship, where we come together Sunday after Sunday to worship and to honor you. We are a people that cries out to you and looks to you for the help and the strength that we need. Come Tuesday, things could change in our nation. We are asking that your will and your plan and your purpose be accomplished in our land, in our world, and among your people. We are praying that you will guide us in making the right choice. And we are praying, Lord, that you will strengthen us, no matter the outcome, that our faith will not be shaken, but our faith will be stable and secure in you, that your will and your purpose will be accomplished in each one of us, that we can go forth the next day and say, my God is alive, my God is in heaven, and I am secure in him. For this I honor you and I praise you in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. 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 That means so be it. Amen. 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 Let's, let's pray. Father, I just want you to bless and keep each one in your name. I want you to cause your face to shine upon them and be gracious to them. I want you to lift your countenance upon them and give them peace in troubled times. And bless our going out and our coming in in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.